Okay, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to speculate about here, and we talk a lot about um, just how many jobs are going to be lost and how many jobs hopefully will be created in the future, but I wanna use this time, or at least a good chunk of this time, to talk about um, the transition period that we're in and what is happening today, because we're already seeing a lot of ramifications of some of the technological disruptions. Um, so I wanna hear, just start out hearing from both of you, what is or maybe should be top of mind for the companies in the room today, based on what's going on today? Stefan, do you wanna start? Yeah, you know, so when people talk about the future of work, I mean, there's usually like three big things that are happening at the same time. One is the rise of automation and AI. Uh, progressively, robots are gonna be stronger than our muscles and the AI is gonna be smarter than our brain. And that is both true and it's also a huge source of fear. Uh, within organization and, and within the general population. The second big thing that's happening at the same time is what the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution. And it's this idea that things are moving faster, or at least they appear to be moving faster than they have in many decades. And so people have to constantly reskill themselves. And there's this constant fear of uh, maybe good enough now, but what happens if I'm not good enough a couple of years from now? Um, and then the third big thing uh, that is happening right now is the rise of the independent workforce. You know, this idea that everybody has to be tethered to a, jo a job, everybody needs to work from nine to five, everybody needs to live in Paris or San Francisco is increasingly being challenged by a larger and larger part of the population. And with that come a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of angst and a lot of challenges as well. And for full disclosure, just real quick, say what your company does. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> so I, I run a company uh, in the Bay Area called Upwork, which is a uh, website for freelancers. So we help companies find uh, developers, designers, consultants, lawyers, accountants, et cetera, et cetera, uh, both in the US uh, and globally. Uh, we create jobs for about 250,000 people right now. Great. From your startup's perspective, <laughs> your small little company you work for, um, give, give your take on what's top of mind and, and what should be top of mind right now. Well, I'd just like to build on one of the things that Stefan said because he described the sort of context in which all this is happening. Let's not also forget that it's happening at a time when there's lots of questions around inequality mm -hmm. and how capitalism is evolving. And it would be disconcerting enough to have all those technology forces, the fourth industrial revolution, if it wasn't also taking place against a backdrop, which I don't need to remind anyone in this room, remains very vivid mm -hmm. of how people are feeling at the moment. Mm -hmm. And one of the statistics which I think every CEO should remember is we did a piece of work looking at what is happening and what is happening in the notion of poorer than their parents. Mm -hmm. Let me just very quickly remind everyone what that says is that between 1993 and 2005, our work showed that for the average household in OECD countries, the so-called developed world, 98% of those households saw their incomes rise, mm -hmm. household income rise. If you do the same piece of work in 2003 through 2015, that 98% has dropped and it's become 30%. In other words, 70% of all the households saw incomes flat or going down. Mm -hmm. That's a problem against which all this is happening. Mm -hmm. So we're also dealing with workforces that fundamentally are dealing with disruption and a reality and a slogan I've heard, which I think captures this notion of the way in which things are changing, that all this disruption means that the pace of change will never be this slow again. Mm -hmm. The pace of change will never be this slow again. And we have this. So as a CEO, how do you lead in that context? And I think that really is the question which I know you want to talk about. Talk so about. You, you raised a good point, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's interesting we're, we're all sitting here um, you know, against the, the backdrop of the one-year anniversary of the Gilets Jaunes movement, right? The Yellow Vest movement. What have we, should we learn from it? And I realize that the protests started not as a direct response to what's going on in the job market, but it's obviously related to the general mood. Well, there's so many factors at work here. I mean, part of it is this reality that we haven't seen incomes rise for very many people, the majority of people in OECD countries. So there's, of course, something to be learned around the system. How does the system work and how do we think about that system? But there's also a lot to be learned around the kind of skills that people need to have going forward. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the subject that we can grapple with, with all the other political parts that are going on. And I think what it says is the following. You could easily take a stance that says, we don't know what the jobs of tomorrow look like. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that stance for the simple reason that actually we know the characteristics. We know that the creative industries are going to be needing more people, not less, and that that's very hard to automate. 
We know that higher cognitive skills as opposed to basic production and machine processing, more people needed there. Mm -hmm. We know that the service sector in terms of empathy, how you interact with people, more jobs needed there. We know that in healthcare delivery, Vast talked eloquently about the research side and medicine side, but when it comes to human care, we still want that, we can see those trends. So I think one of the realities that it means is, are we building the skills now that we know are going to be needed in this transition, here and now, not for the future, but in this transition, are we making sure that the educational authorities are focused on the right things, that the incentives that government can put in place are focused on the right things, mm -hmm. that management is also looking to evolve the portfolio of businesses to reflect the realities of where the workforce can be deployed. I think that's part of what we need to learn, and I hope we are learning from all that's been going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, you know, if um, it's become a much more complex, uh, you know, movement in the last, you know, few quarters, so it's a little bit harder to just wrap your head around it, but the way it started was because of a fuel tax, mm -hmm. right? And it started because the cost of living and the cost of transportation was becoming uh, unaffordable for lots and lots of people, and I think, because this is a business meeting and we're speaking in front of CEOs here, I think company executives have a role to play in getting better, creating better jobs and allowing people to have a more affordable way of life. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, like, you know, in Paris specifically, increasingly the people that live in Paris have jobs that can be done from anywhere else in the country. And increasingly the people whose jobs really require them to be in Paris, you know, the people that do the catering in this uh, conference, as an example, can't afford to, to live anywhere nearby because the cost of living is so high. And so increasingly what, you know, what this says to me from a being actionable standpoint is if you're the CEO of a French company, and, and by the way, the same is true in San Francisco and New York and many, many other superstar cities in the world. But increasingly, jobs have been concentrated in a smaller and smaller number of cities, which has made the cost of living rise faster than people's wages and has also dramatically increased uh, social inequality within those cities. If you're running one of those companies, allow people to work from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like most of the jobs that are being done in La Défense or in the big office towers of your uh, headquarters can be done from somewhere else. And if you let just 10 or 20% of the people who currently live in Paris move to Les Provinces, you know, the, the other parts of the country, uh, that will have a nonlinear impact to congestion, to pollution, to the cost of living, and will open up a lot of space to allow uh, people that are currently very far away from Paris to be able to come back inside of the city. And that to me, mm -hmm is how it started and it's evolved since then, but the general movement remains this impression that the, the job market is not working for an increasing number of people. And just to, to kind of you know, connect that thread very directly, what you're saying to the Yellow Vest movement and how this started, one of the um, early activists actually was, was quoted a while back saying, the problem of this tax is that when you live in the suburbs, when you live in the countryside and you have to go to work maybe an hour from your home, you need to have fuel to put in your car and it's very expensive for these people, less expensive for citizens in big cities um, because of salaries, public transportation, et cetera. So how, as an employer, I mean, what companies are actually doing this and why are we still so uncomfortable with the concept of remote work? Uh, so I would say it's very different in different countries, right? So this has become extremely commonplace in Australia, as an example. Uh, you know, we, we see a lot of really big businesses in Australia that are just fundamentally, there's only a small handful of big cities and lots and lots of people living everywhere else. Um, I would say in the US, people are in denial that it's there, but it's there. Like your, work for, your sales force is probably fully distributed, um, and you probably have a bunch of different regional offices everywhere, and probably a bunch of your employees, whether you know it or not, work from home two or three days a week, right? And so, the, and, and by the way, when, when your office has more than two floors, people do not walk from one floor to the other, right? They slack each other, they Zoom each other, they Skype each other, and so fundamentally, whether you have two floors in the same building or two floors in two different cities, it makes no difference. I would say the situation is very different here, and I would say particularly French companies, I think, from what I can tell, and from what the numbers we see, uh, are still more tra run more traditionally with this idea that um, you, know, you meet face-to-face -face and FaceTime matters, and yes, we manage by objectives, but frankly, if you're not in the office, we're not quite sure that you're doing work right now, and that needs to change. I mean, that is essentially what people are struggling with, this idea that, um, the catch-22, you know, if you move to Paris, you can't afford to live there. If you don't move to Paris, there are no good jobs, and that just seems like an opportunity for innovative companies to behave in a different way and 
create jobs for people that are otherwise being left uh, behind, which is particularly ironic given that everybody's complaining about the skills gap. It's so hard to find talent. Well, it's so hard to find talent because you're looking in the same place as everybody else from a very finite talent pool. If you start to relax some of the constraints around the education you want people to have or the location you want them to have, then suddenly there's a lot less of a skills gap than the way people are looking for talent. Today. Stefan raises a very important point. I mean, I won't comment in France, but if you come into the United States, 25 cities account for 60% of all the job growth that's taken place in the United States. And that's only going to go in one direction. Those cities are going to acquire more and more of it. And frankly, if you talk about San Francisco, Los Angeles, and you look at technology jobs, it's an enormous proportion. So actually, it's, a, it's how do you break this cycle? Because the cycle is very strong. Urbanization has been one of the forces which has lifted a lot of people out of poverty around the world. So I think we're commingling two issues. One is the reality that urbanization is increasing, not slowing. And it's favoring the winning cities, mm -hmm. which typically are those which have a technology base and an infrastructure. So that's one force. The second force is, of course, within those cities, how people choose to work with each other. And I do, and I would endorse a lot of what you're saying, Stefan, about the reality of how people work is changing. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting to observe, you actually see with some of the millennials, they like being together. They like being in co-working spaces. They see it as part of the social psychology of work. And actually, there's a lot of evidence that in the independent working sector or freelance sector, whatever you want to call it, part of the issue is because they're working in a way in which they're not tethered to one employer, they put even more premium on having the social interaction of being together, even if it's because they're working in different spaces. And that's why you can see the phenomena of these hubs that have risen. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've got several forces which are actually pushing in the opposite direction to one you may want it to, because of course, if we end up with winning cities being so much the gravitational pool for work, we're going to have a real issue in the rest of the country. And France may be a more distributed economy, incidentally, than many others. But you can certainly see in the US this is happening, and it's, of course, happened in my own country, the United Kingdom. OK. Um, I, I want to get back to, um, you know, we're talking about the skills gap. And then on the other end of it, of course, there's the loss of jobs in, in certain areas. And you guys have done research on lighthouse manufacturers, um, sort of the manufacturers that are leading the way. And what you found, and I want you to talk some more about this and explain it, but you found that the leaders in uh, harnessing automation are not using it to replace workers, right. not outright at least, not right now. Um, can you explain who these leaders are and what they're doing? Mikhail, you, that is the important headline. The leaders don't use it to displace jobs. They use it to become more productive, more able to compete successfully, and frankly, on that basis, more able to recruit and deploy. What we've been looking at is how do you make the most of really three forces that are driving a lot of manufacturing trends? One is connection. You can join things up in ways you couldn't before, machines. Secondly, you can automate in a far more flexible fashion. We've had automation for quite some time, but you can start to manage ups, peaks, and troughs much more effectively using the technologies that are available today. And crucially, these technologies are intelligent. You get information back that you can act on. Predictive maintenance is the buzzword that's doing the rounds at the moment. And we've looked at 16 manufacturing sites that live up to the task of taking these ideas and not piloting, but putting them fully into deployment. Incidentally, they've been characterized by increasing the number of workers they have. Mm. They've been characterized by, for example, the group Schneider plant here in France, one of their plants, where they've used uh, what they're calling smart manufacturing technologies, which essentially being able to take the work floor, the shop floor, and turn it into a 3D rendering. So you can actually see what's going on inside the machines. You can start joining things up in different ways. And that's given a whole lease of life to their facilities. We've seen it with Tata in the Netherlands, where they've got essentially they're using information and intelligence to know when machines are going to break before they do break. Mm -hmm. And then they can redeploy people away from servicing them to actually being those that anticipate the problem in the first instance. And employment in those sites has gone up. So I think part of the issue here is let's not assume that in all cases automation means you lay lots of people off. Mm -hmm. It can and it should in many situations, but it doesn't always be the case. And the laggards are more likely to pay that price than those who embrace and adopt early. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I know there's there's also research on uh, AI implementations and that the more successful projects are the ones that are looking at ways of increasing revenue, not um, decreasing costs. But but I was in one of our earlier lunch ses sessions and somebody kind of, you know, 
pardon my French, but called BS on some of what was being said, um, and that, that companies uh, need to start being more honest about, you know, the long, in the long run, there are going to be massive job losses here, and um, getting employees comfortable with the idea of maybe right now working alongside technology is kind of a, a, a big ask. How are you, what are you seeing from companies you talk to and from clients? and what they're hearing from their employees. Well, There's a lot of fear. No, I mean, the, 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 the reality is the transition is very concerning. Like, many, like every industrial revolution, you can actually paint a picture that says there will be more jobs. Mm -hmm. And that picture can be painted really brightly, and it was true in the prior industrial revolutions. The issue is the transition. And that observation I actually agree with, which is in that transition, there are going to be very significant shifts. That's the 400 million number that we talked about mm -hmm. at the beginning. So in that context of you know, not being honest, I think means not actually facing into the real challenge, which is how do you reskill at a scale that recognizes some people are going to have to do some things very differently. And we are going to have to attach a different way to thinking about what those jobs look like. Because it is the case that when it comes to machine processing, the basics, despite the examples I gave of lighthouse manufacturing, there will be less jobs because we are going to automate quite a lot of them. And if you start looking across sectors, and again, I think start being honest about which sectors are going to really see the reductions, it becomes urgent to then say, how do we get people into the tasks and the areas like healthcare, like infrastructure, mm -hmm. like technology itself, and do so in a way that recognizes the opportunities there, but also says to people, if on average, and this is a number again for the US, people have somewhere between 12 and 13 employers over the course of their career, that number is going to go looking very differently. So you're no longer going to be training people for a job for life, not that that ever existed, because the statistics show it never did. But you're certainly going to be training people for employability, skills that allow them to get the next job and keep moving. And that's what I think employers and governments alike need to be working on. And yes, it is the case that in that context, also recognizing that some jobs will have a different value than we attach to them today, mm -hmm. because the nature of what's being done is different. So there was a, a recent survey from uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers that said, found that more than 70% of people would be willing to augment their bodies and brains in order to improve their employment prospects. Um, that's crazy. I mean, do you, do you, I don't know who they surveyed. Um, I'm guessing there was a by, scientific sample. What do they mean by augment their bodies? I'm getting nervous. Oh, I mean. I'm getting I, really nervous here. Maybe taller? I, I, <laughs> I can only imagine. But, um, but, but is that kind of, is it misguided? Because, you know, what you, you talked earlier about creative skills and a lot of, you know, the EQ and, and you deal with a lot of creatives that are um, using Upwork. So what kind of, how should we be thinking about reskilling? I think it's easy to always think about technical skills and STEM, what's the right approach? Yeah, so I think you know, what we see from our clients is some of them have it easier than others, right? So fundamentally, if you're a company that has lots and lots of knowledge workers and you have very high margins today, investing in continuous learning, I mean, that's what McKinsey does, right? I mean, it's like it, the ROI is there. It's very logical for you to invest in continuously uh, reskilling your workforce. The challenge is, you know, if you're a retailer, you're already really struggling and you have a choice between retraining a lot of people, losing even more money, and probably having to let go a lot of people even faster, or you know, keeping their job as long as possible, fully knowing that at the end, a lot of retail jobs are either going to be automated or Amazon is going to completely take over the world. And those are the ones that are you know, really in a tough position. And I would say that is why public-private partnerships need to exist. Right? You can't put the honors completely on the government and say, yeah, it's totally fine if companies lay off everybody and you know, nobody's trained anymore and the taxpayer is going to cover the cost. But it's equally true that some companies are really in a catch-22 at this stage and where we do need to fix the safety net. Right? In a lot of countries, the safety net is not adapted to the 21st century. And in particular, this, ocean, this notion of a safety trampoline as opposed to a safety net. You know, how do we get people not be caught in the net mm -hmm. and stuck there, but bounce off of it very quickly? One of the big challenges you hear from workers a lot as it relates to reskilling is when? Like, I'm working two shifts, I'm working 18 hours a day, I can barely meet, make ends meet, I don't have the money and I really don't have the time to go teach myself another skill. Plus, by the way, where are the jobs? Like, mm -hmm. even if I learn something new, like, how do I know that I'm going to get a better life? And so creating the, the time and, you know, the financing to be able to do this. I mean, I, I, would, I would give an example. France has created a, uh, in, you know, an individual learning account uh, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, which Singapore also did. And the idea there is to have, you know, money that is being put in an account that lets people 
uh, reskill themselves throughout their lives. One of the you know, uh, biggest challenges is companies tend to invest the most in the people that need it the less because they're the ones the who are high performers already. And the people that are the most at risk are the people that uh, companies tend to spend less time and less money reskilling. Um, it's a big topic and there's so much to get to, but I want to make sure and address any questions from you guys out there. Can we get a microphone over? And if you could introduce yourself. Hello, Stéphane Lafarge from Herman Miller. Uh, question for uh, the gentleman from Upwork. I'm, I'm curious to know how much you know you create links between people who are looking for a job and employers or who have a need. How much of those links are within country, as opposed to you know a need being served from India for a client in Helsinki? You know his name is also Stefan. Yes, and that's okay. a great first name. <laughs> that's what you asked me. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, the, um, so the, uh, the, uh, the biggest country for us, both on the buyer side and on the freelancer side, is the US. But that being said, there's like a lot of cross-border. So we have tons and tons of, in particular, Asian companies that are trying to understand how to go to market in the US. And they hire people in the US to understand what the local environment looks like. And conversely, you've got tons and tons of uh, American companies that hire consultants through the platform to figure out their go-to-market strategy in Germany or Italy or what have you. Uh, but I would say, increasingly, what we find is it tends to be within one country, but it tends to be not within commuting distance. So one of the reasons why uh, you know, people use a platform like us is precisely because there's a huge shortage of talent, and it's very visible in San Francisco where we're based, right? In San Francisco, if you're not Google or Facebook, hiring machine learning experts is like completely impossible, right? And yet every company in the Bay Area needs to hire machine learning experts. So you find people that, you know, graduated from CMU and live in Pittsburgh or somewhere around Pittsburgh, and you hire them to work for you remotely. Um, we can take one more extremely fast question over here. Gary Shapiro, Consumer Technology Association. I was concerned about, I was interested rather in your impression of the White House Ivanka Trump led move where 10 million jobs have been committed by over 300 employers to be upskilled within the next five years. Well, I mean, the scale at which uh, this has to happen means you do need government and others to act. And I think the reality is that what's needed is a whole range of moves. We need tax incentives, you need uh, you need educational standards, you need credentialing. One of the things government can do is actually provide credentials, endorse what workers are doing in very different ways than we do today. The university degree, quite honestly, becomes less and less relevant in this environment. I think, in fact, one of the things you've been pioneering, I think, is to take that out of some resumes. And you also need to make sure that ultimately we have a, a vehicle for actually moving people between jobs. We've talked about reskilling, but it's also a lot about redeployment. Retail is a great example of people coming out of the front of the store and into the warehouse. Those are different types of jobs with different skills, yes, but it is a place where you redeploy. And so I think what the, whether the 10 million is right and wrong or somewhere in between, I won't comment, but the scale, that's getting off to that kind of number and it means we have to deploy in many different ways than today. Well, again, there is so much to tackle here. I know we only scratched the surface, but um, Stefan, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.